Hello, Dr. Jim. How are you? Uh, the network is very weak. Uh, maybe today, today or tomorrow, you will arrive. I hope too. Uh, maybe I'm not sure, but. Jonas was born in Eritrea in 1991. Like most Eritreans I met in Libya, he'd fled the dictatorship in his country and compulsory military service the United Nations has described as akin to slavery. I met him in 2019 in Dar al Jebel Detention Center in the mountains south of Tripoli. I was with Médecins Sans Frontières, which had just begun giving medical consultations in the center. I exchanged phone numbers with several Daytonese. For migrants, owning a smartphone is the only way they can maintain contact with their families, but also with people they call their helpers, aid workers, activists and journalists, who do what they can to help them or to obtain information. Shortly after I met Jonas, we started texting each other information. I left Libya, but stayed in phone contact with Jonas and other Daytonese. The ones who have smartphones post videos on social media of protests they hold inside the prison. They use tomato sauce and red pepper to write slogans on their mattresses. Some other Daytonese tell me that about 30 have escaped. Jonas is one of them. Five months later, I'm back in Libya and I managed to re-establish contact with him. While he waits for the boat to be ready and the sea to be calm, Jonas worries about the position of the rescue vessels. Uh, please text me if you have any uh, deep information or any information about that. Just uh, message me, uh, dear. I tell him the Ocean Viking, the vessel chartered by SOS Mediterranean and Médecins Sans Frontières, is blocked in France. Italy and Malta are using the COVID pandemic to obstruct rescue operations. But another rescue vessel, the Alan Kurdi, is on its way to Libya. Hello, Jerome, how are you? Oh, you okay? How about you? I hope you are well from the virus. I'm too interested at this time, man. I'm optimistic because, you know, I'm part of dealing. I'm waiting for a long one to share. And that's why I'm interested about the Alan Kurdi and other rescue vessels uh, deal. I hope it will be. And the last time for us, if we, if we arrive one time, that means. A few weeks later, Jonas stops answering his phone. It must be because he's at sea. Oh, hello, hello, Dr. Jerome, how are you? I'm Jonas, I'm Jonas with you. We are in big trouble, uh, Dr. Jerome. Uh, it's three, uh, three days we are in the water, uh, Malta's water. They turn back to the uh, Tunisian shear water because we finished the petrol. We are in big trouble. The, now we are in Tunisia. They entered us uh, in Tunisia. Some fishing vessels, they entered us 
they bring us to Tunisia. So we are in quarantine, in quarantine in Tunisia now. We need a help. Jonas is exhausted. He says he left Libya three days ago, at four in the morning. Fifty people were on board, 40 Eritreans, including a baby, two Nigerians, two Senegalese, one Guinean and five Pakistanis. The fishing boat towed them about six miles of the Tunisian coast and disappeared north. They managed to get themselves to shore before being picked up by the Tunisian coast guard. It's not impossible that the Maltese authorities this well-organized return. Jonas has stopped answering again. I am also in contact with Aishak, another Eritrean who escaped from Dar al-Jabal detention center. I ask him if he's had any news from Jonas. Using the information Aishak has given me, I contact Alarm Phone, a hotline that puts pressure on Maltese and Italian rescue centers to launch rescue operations. Jonas's boat manages to reach Malta's search and rescue zone, but for hours, the Maltese authorities do not respond to calls. Hey Jerome, how are you? Uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad. I'm so happy. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are in quarantine now. Uh, no one is to visit us or contact us because we are in closet. You know, we are in quarantine.